It's April 2019, and I'm sitting in my London office in a small booth at work. It's 5 p.m., and it's my last meeting of the day. I feel really excited because I'm going to talk about my promotion with my manager. I have received great feedback on my work, and the company is doing really well. And as my manager joins the meeting, she looks very quiet and she doesn't make eye contact with me. And she says something to me. She says something to me that stayed with me ever since. She said to me that I was not ready yet for the promotion and that I should demonstrate that I was capable of managing a team first. I felt devastated. According to a study by Massachusetts Institute of Technology, women do not get promoted because managers underestimate their potential. And according to a lean-in study, for every 100 men who get a promotion, only 72 women experience the same thing. I often wondered if I had told my manager that I was already managing a team at home of a four-year-old and a six-year-old, maybe I would have gotten the promotion? But in any case, this made me wonder, how do leaders choose their words? And what makes leaders say what they say? A few weeks after that event, I came across an article that really caught my attention. The article said that in the Fortune 500 companies, there are more CEOs named John than women CEOs. And only 3% of the US population is named John and 50% of the US population is female. So that's the equivalent of excluding half of the population from top leadership positions. So if you're ever with the CEO of a big company and if you can't remember their name, try John <laughs> and you might be on the right track. But um, as a diversity and inclusion consultant, I have consulted with many organizations in helping them create a more inclusive workplace. I've consulted with large organizations and I've consulted with small organizations. And there is one thing I've noticed that great leaders do. Great leaders use the same words to describe men and women. In contrast, there are many leaders who talk about a man's potential for a promotion and they talk about a woman's need to demonstrate their past accomplishment first. Think about it this way. Imagine it's your birthday and you, and you invite your best friends and your family to celebrate your birthday. Imagine that you, um, you order your favorite birthday cake. Imagine that someone walks into the room, they cut your cake in half and they throw away half of your cake in the bin. How would you feel about not being able to enjoy the whole cake? It's like we throw away half of the talent in the bin when we exclude all the women from leadership positions. I know I love food, so I would always go for the whole cake option. But today, more than ever before, we must bridge the gender gap. Did you know that the time it will take to close the gender gap in the world has increased from 99 years before the pandemic to 135 years since the pandemic? So that's the equivalent of waiting 99 years to bridge the gender gap and also waiting for the life of a baby being born today and waiting, waiting until she or he reaches their mid-30s. So today, I will share with you three ways that great leaders choose their words to make the world a more inclusive place. Number one, great leaders avoid gender-biased words. Did you know that 44% of women will not apply to a job if the job description includes the word aggressive? That's nearly 50% of all the women who will not even send their CV to a job if it has the word aggressive in the job description. A few years ago, I was part of a team that was distributed across the US and Europe. And our team meetings often turned into spirited debates. That's code word for arguments. Everybody had very strong opinions and was very vocal. One day, my manager came to me and she said something to me that, to this day, stayed with me. She said that I was being too aggressive and too emotional during those team meetings and I should soften down my tone. When I asked her about my male colleagues, she said they were just being assertive and passionate. Um, but when we use words like 
emotional or aggressive to describe women, we make them feel less qualified. Nobody wants to be called aggressive or a drama queen at work. In contrast, when we use masculine words like right-hand man or manpower in a job description, we make women feel like they don't belong. As James Brown famously said, this is a man's word, but it would be nothing without a woman or a girl. Number two, great leaders fight microaggressions. Who has ever been in a meeting and you heard someone asking the only woman in the room, can you take notes? Or can you book the restaurant? Yeah, a few years ago, I was part of a senior leadership team and Christmas was approaching and our manager wanted to host a Christmas gathering for the leadership team. I was the only woman in the team and he asked me if I could book the restaurant for the Christmas gathering. I ended up spending hours researching restaurants, making calls, sending emails, coordinating the time with my colleagues, whilst my male colleagues were just getting on with their work. Think, of my, uh, think about microaggressions like mosquito bites. When you only get bitten by a mosquito every once in a while, it's annoying, but it's not that big of a deal. But when you get bitten by a mosquito over and over and over again, it can become overwhelming. And some people get bitten by mosquitoes all the time. So next time you need help with restaurant booking, remember that nobody likes mosquito bites and maybe you can ask a man to help. Three, great leaders um, do not give vague feedback to women. Researchers at Stanford University found that the main reason for the lack of women in leadership is due to the vague feedback that women receive over their careers. By analyzing performance reviews from three large technology companies, they found that women were less likely than men to receive feedback tied to business outcome. And in contrast, men received a clearer picture of what they were doing right to impact the business and what to do to get promoted. The study also found that women were praised for team contributions versus individual accomplishments. Suggestions for improvement for women were focused on their emotion, personality and tone. And those uh, um, for men were focused on specific actionable feedback. Women were, were also described as being helpful, collaborative and supportive twice as often as men and, wait for it, they received 76% of the mention of being too aggressive. In contrast, words used to describe men included drive, transform, tackle and innovate. As Bill Gates famously said, we all need feedback. That's how we improve. So here you have it, three ways that great leaders choose their words to create a more inclusive society. Number one, they avoid gender biased words like aggressive, emotional or manpower. Number two, they fight microaggressions like mosquito bites. And number three, they avoid giving vague feedback to women and instead they focus on practical and actionable feedback. As human beings, we are all biased. We all say things without thinking about it. But we all have the power to choose our words. And we can, we can all become heroes by using a more inclusive language. So let's do this. Let's choose our words better to become the inclusive leaders we were born to be. Thank you.